Since the beginning of time, God's presence has been made known. At creation, he hovered over the entire earth. As the children of Israel wandered the desert, his presence was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. To Elijah, God's presence was not in the wind or an earthquake or even fire, but in a gentle whisper. When Jesus was born, God's presence was experienced in his only son, the light of the world. And when Jesus established his church, his presence appeared as tongues of fire. Today, God's presence can still be experienced in extraordinary ways in our everyday lives. But how will you respond? Will he go unnoticed? Or will you embrace him and worship? Good evening. Hi. Too much turkey, I guess. <laughs> Two of you got that. Good evening. How are you? Let's wake up together. All right. Yeah? So, uh, um, anyways, if you weren't here last week, uh, we're in this series called Presence, and Mark has taught the last couple weeks, and just honestly, fantastic job. I just remember, uh, I don't know about you, but for our family, it's been hard going to church recently with kids getting sick and um, everything going on, and then we were on vacation, and so it just was so good to be uh, back in church and be together uh, with the family of God, and, and then just to be here, and I just, I mean, last week, Mark talk just in this cool imagery and uh, uh, about the altars and Abraham. And, and if, you, if you weren't here, go grab the CD because uh, it was one of those where I, I just remember where I was sitting right back there and God really spoke to me and I think he'll speak to you. Um, but let me pray for us and then we'll get going, okay? God, thanks for tonight. Ask that, uh, ask that you would speak. Even more than that, I, I ask that we would hear. That you would give us uh, eyes to see what you're doing in us and, and the courage to respond to your prodding and your movement. Would you allow this to be a holy and sacred moment and would you, all the things that you have for us to hear be said? So God, would you move? Let your glory fall in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Those of you who don't know, my name's Ryan, and uh, I work here with students and with uh, Awakening, our college-age ministry. So if you'd open your notes, let's dig in uh, to presence tonight. If you want to, you can kind of thumb to Isaiah chapter 6. That's where we're going. But, but aren't there some experiences in your life, in my life, that no ma matter how many times you experience it, no matter how many times you go through it, uh, it still fills you with wonder and awe. I mean, I mean, there are just some things that never grow mundane, that never tire, that never just get old. Uh, in my life, one of those experiences is we're experience, expecting the birth of our third child. Thank you. I appreciate that. Shame on the rest of you. Um, but, I mean, this is, this is just awesome. I mean, I have two amazing, really cool, you know, bright, blonde, toehead kids, Ella and Ryder. She, Ella's five, Ryder's turning three in February, and, and now we're expecting a new boy on the way. And, and to tell you the thing is, is, I've gone through this whole pregnancy deal twice, and I know the guys don't have the hard job in it. It's still kind of tough, I think. Um, don't tell my wife, you know. When she was in labor with Ryder, I was just like, man, I'm tired, babe. My back's kind of hurting, and she didn't like that. But there's just something amazing, supernatural that you look at it, and, and I, it's not that we've gone through this twice, and the third time, there's still this kind of like wonder and awe and the reality that a human life is forming in my wife's belly, and, and then there's going to be this kind of crazy birth time that I'm kind of still freaked out about, even though I've gone through twice. Now, now the reality is, 
is our relationship with God is designed to be that way. Our encounter and when we interact with him is designed that it shouldn't ever grow mundane or cold. It should always fill us with wonder and awe. But the problem is, is, is for you and I, or at least I'll speak for me, is, is it does grow cold. It does just kind of get old. In fact, maybe you have the experience that I kind of had uh, last week getting ready for church. You know, my family's all kind of getting ready, and I happen to sleep in a little bit. Uh, and, you know, I wake up and look, and it's 8 o'clock, and I'm going, dang, we got to be here at 9.30, and we still got to get the kids fed and dressed, and so we're running around trying to get food, uh, and, you know, by the time we get in the car, I'm just pretty angry going to church. You, you know, I, I mean, as we're driving, you know, Jenny's like talking, and I just kind of snap at her, and she's like, okay, just leave him alone for a minute. Ryan needs his quiet space, uh, you know, and, and, and we get here, we get here rushed, we get here late, there's, you know, five minutes, the music's already started, we shove our kids in the room, you know, thank you very much, get our little, you know, beeper, pager, whatever it is, come in here, and just kind of sit, and go through the motions, and, and, and what I'd suggest, uh, as we're going to begin to look at Isaiah coming to the temple of God, that the temple was this place where, where they would prepare their hearts on the way to go there to meet with God, that, that when we enter the presence of God, and that's the goal here, that's the goal of every time we come together as a collective community, is that we would enter the presence of God, that it wouldn't be just a mundane deal, but that we would stop for a minute or for an hour and 15 minutes and, and get our eyes focused on him. And when we enter the presence of God, reverence is our proper response of worship. Now, this is something that we have lost as a culture and as a society. Reverence, awe, oh, wonder. King James would, would say fear, but not the afraid, but the t kind that Mark just explained about this, whoa. I, th I think we've lost it just because we're too busy. In fact, Scripture says, be still and know that I am God. So how do we, re how do we return to the wonder and awe of it all? How do we begin to develop something that should every single time be, oh, that when we enter the presence of God, it, it, it should take us back. We should go, oh, my God, and mean it. How do we begin to develop reverence in our worship? Because when we meet God, and every time I see it in scriptures, that is the only proper response to God. Every time, consistently throughout Scripture, God shows up, it is a reverential, awe-inspiring moment. And I believe he wants to meet us in the same way. We meet a guy named Isaiah who had an encounter with God that I believe will give us some just keys to ex experiencing this reverential worship, to developing this awe-inspiring wonder of who God is. And, and here's the first principle or the first point. Reverential worship, awe-inspiring worship, when we enter the, the presence of God, stop and look up. Refocus your heart on God. In fact, this is what Isaiah uh, wrote down in, in his vision uh, of, of meeting the king of kings. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling one to another, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Isaiah walks to the temple where the people of God gathered corporately. He's coming to the temple, and he walks in into a worship service already happening, but it wasn't happening by you or me. It was happening by the heavenly host, and he sees something. And he stopped, and he looked up, and his heart was refocused to God. In fact, it, it, it gives us a little date, a little uh, kind of mile marker. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. And, and this just isn't kind of like uh, telling us when things happen. Uzziah was a great and mighty king, uh, an, an awesome conquering king, and he really walked closer with God. He didn't end well, but for about 50 years, he reigned as king, and there's peace, and there's prosperity, and there's spiritual fervor in the land. And, and, and what this is denoting, this is, is not just saying when it happened. It's kind of explaining the emotional and spiritual and economic state that Isaiah and the nation of Israel are in. It, it's, it's like saying this, uh, when 9-11 happened. That, that just doesn't tell us, you know, 9-11, like the date. It tells us what we know. I mean, all of us remember being there. It takes us right back when JFK was assassinated. In the year that King Uzziah died, he walks in into this counter, and I love this part though, because there's fear and there's uncertainty in the future. There's a people in a nation mourning what's going on, and the whole nation's in crisis. They're unsure of the, what's going on. Does it sound like where we're kinda at right now? That maybe you are going through something really hard. In the midst of that, God says, I still want to meet you. Would you stop and would you look up? In the year that your son walked away, in the year that you got that biopsy report, in the year that that relationship fell apart, God says, even in the midst of your darkest moment, I want to meet you. Sometimes it's those moments that finally cause us to stop long enough to truly see God, isn't it? He says, as he refocuses his heart on God, he says, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. See, because in the midst of that year, you need a God that is in control. You need a God that is not shaken. You need, you know, though the great king of Israel may have left the throne, the greatest king is still on the throne. See, there's only one instance where we ever see God not sitting in control, where he's not flustered and kind of walking around, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Oh, this is so crazy. What do I do? You know, he's not biting his nails. He's seated and in control. The only time we see God standing is to welcome his martyred ones home. When you stop and you look up and you begin to get a view of God, your view begins with seeing God seated as the rightful king of the universe in control. And he's high and exalted. His rightful place in the universe, that he is the center of it all. He is the center of the universe. And a little diagnostic question for you. If God is at the center of the universe, if his position is over all, let me just reverently ask you, what's his position in your life? Where's he right? See, you get clarity on life when you stop and look and see God for who he is. That he's seated on the throne in control, high and exalted. And it gives us this picture that the train of his robe filled the temple. It's this beautiful picture of God in all his splendor, in all his majesty, completely clothed in glory. And, and, and literally, in the ancient days, the length of a king's robe revealed the amount of dominion and power that a king had, how great his kingdom was. And, and what God's wanting to reveal to Isaiah in this moment is though life seems really uncertain, the future is fearful, I am still king. 
I am still seated and in control. My position has not changed, and I am still in power and, and authority. And then we get this beautiful picture of holiness redefined. When the angels, these seraphims, calling one to another, holy, holy, holy. A seraph just, their name literally means burning one. They seem to be charged, this is with guarding the holiness of God. And they are surrounding him and they cannot even look at him. God is so holy, though they are perfect beings, that they cover their face. And it seems, I don't know quite why they cover their feet, but perhaps in humble servants to God. And they call one to another, holy, holy, holy. The, the triplet of holiness is, is emphasizing and saying, there is none like you, there is no other. You are completely holy. Holy means set apart, completely perfect, brilliant in righteousness. I just, uh, I think it's interesting when I watch the angels enter the presence of God, perfect beings, and how they respond to God. I, I had this kind of, as I was studying it this week, this kind of revelation. I, sh I should take a note from them. If they being perfect, how they respond in absolute adoration and reverence, how much more should I? In fact, I, I would just encourage us, as we gather corporately, to prepare to worship. The people of Israel did this. When they would come to the temple, you'll see in, in the Psalms near the back of the book, you'll see the Psalms of Ascent. It means the Psalms that are going up to the temple, that along their way, as they would go to enter to the presence of God, they would prepare their hearts for this. They would be singing songs, getting their hearts ready to meet with God. What if, just, just crazy what if, what if we woke up maybe half an hour early on Sundays. I know, it's a big if. Or, you know, stopped what we're doing on Saturdays a half an hour early. And just put on some worship music. And began to prepare our hearts. And come and knowing that this is just a building, but knowing that the presence of God that God wants to meet me here and already begin that process. How would that change the way we worship? How would that change when we sit down here and the first song isn't just kind of this rush through and get settled? It, it becomes we are just running to the throne of God. And as Isaiah looks up and begins to refocus his heart on who God is, he is compelled and moved. He can't help it in the presence of who God is, is that God's holiness is like an x-ray machine on his soul. And he looks in. He, he looks in and he sees himself just as he really is. In the presence of who God is, we get a really accurate view of who we really are. And he releases anything that keeps him from God. I, uh, in college, I took a weightlifting class. And I obviously don't really lift weights by the look of me. But it was fun. And I, I, I was spotting this guy that was a, 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 you know, a, a piano major or whatever. A pretty frail guy because I think all he did was play piano. And, and as, as we were kind of doing these, uh, 
things with dumbbells, I was saying hi to my friend, not really spotting him. And out of the corner of my eye, I see his arm just drop. And I look down, and, and I noticed that he didn't actually let go of the weights. And so it just pulled his arm out of its socket. It's like, hey, and I was just like, that's not good. And so, and so we go to the hospital, and, you know, he's, his arm, and I'm going, like, great, I just messed up this guy's career, you know. He'll never play a piano. He'll be the one-handed piano player. Um, and, and as we got there, we, we knew what was wrong. Doctors could tell what was wrong. But even in the light of that, they still took an x-ray. Because had they made one wrong move, had something not been there, had they just gone in, they could have totally messed up his shoulder. But they took the x-ray to examine what was going on, to see exactly what had happened, to see the damage that was done, so that they could accurately prepare, uh, repair it. And, and, and see, God, in the midst of when we come and encounter him and experience the holiness of God, it begins to reveal the deep areas of our needs so that the great physician can go to work in our soul. And Isaiah says this, oh, it's me. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. In the midst of this, Isaiah gets a really good, clear picture of who he is in the light of who God is. And he says, whoa! Throughout the book, Isaiah is going to pronounce woe or judgment on cities and people that are rebelling to him, uh, rebelling from God. And in the midst of experiencing God, he pronounces judgment on himself. He says, woe to me. I am ruined. It's, it's I'm as good as dead. For my lips. And in fact, we see if we fast forward, Jesus says that unclean lips are caused by an unclean heart. There's a deeper matter going on. And it's this act of confession before God, of dealing with what needs to be dealt with. See, confession is simply agreeing with God about your sin. It is getting real, and it's getting honest, and it's just going, God, you see all of it, and now I see all of it. Here I am. Getting really painfully clear. And so, in fact, I just encourage you to make a daily habit of asking the Spirit of God to search your heart and reveal any way, area in your life. Spirit of God, would you just search me today? And confession always brings cleansing. I love this picture of, of, the, of the seraph flying to the altar. In fact, this is the coals of the fire were taken inside the holy place on the day of atonement when sacrifice was made to atone for sin. He goes to the altar, the place where this atonement is looking forward to the ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb of God on the cross says, I'm going to take this coal and touch your lips and bring, what do you say? Your sin is atoned for, it's paid for, and your guilt is taken away. Friends, too many of us are walking guilty are living under shame that has already been paid for by the blood of the Lamb on the cross. Would you simply get real with God and look in? Would you get to the point where you, you want to do anything? You'd release anything that's keeping you from God. In fact, I, I love this quote from A.W. Tozer in his Knowledge of the Holy. It's in this chapter on holiness. 
He says, until we have seen ourselves as God sees us, we are not likely to be much disturbed over the conditions around us, as long as they don't get so far out of hand as to threaten our comfortable way of life. We have learned to live with unholiness and come to look upon it as a natural and expected thing. Reverential worship looks up and sees who God is, and it always moves us to look in and get real and get clean before God. You have the promise on on Scripture says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive your sin and purify you from all unrighteousness. That you can walk out of here tonight guiltless, free. We sang that I am free. Some of us haven't experienced it. Experience it tonight. In light of who you are and in light of what he has done, the most reasonable response, the most obvious response of going, God, I, whoa. And I, I get a clear picture of who I am, and I really understand I don't deserve this at all. The most reasonable response is here I am. Use me. Is that we respond to God's call on our life. That is the most reasonable response we could have. In fact, God asks this, and I, I love how he kind of puts it out there as if, you know, he's kind of pondering, but he says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? It's not that God's questioning, going, I don't have a clue. He knows. He was set aside Isaiah. He has a calling on his life. And he's, he's now, Isaiah has gone through the process with God. That God has done deep work in him so he can now do great work through him. And Isaiah goes, here am I. Send me. You know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of church being like a movie theater where we come and we sit and we go, very good, and we leave. I, I think church is more like a holy huddle where, where we come, we experience, and then we live it out. Where we come and we go, yeah, this is a refresher. God, charge me up. I'm living it out. Send me. Use me. If you can use me at all, I can't believe that you would even call me and that you know me, that you love me. Use me. I'm overwhelmed by you. Would you live it out? Go for him. Leave this place and leave it knowing that you are the son and the daughter of the king. You are marked by his love and sent to bring his love to a dark and hopeless world. I have a weird thing, and when I teach, this is... I always get this. Some of you know my dad's a pastor, and I grew up the pastor's kid, and then he afterwards did kind of radio and book stuff. And, and I always had this growing up, because uh, we grew up in Santa Cruz, this concept of wherever I went, I bore the name of my father. In a lot of ways, that... that that kept me from doing some stuff that I, I would have gotten into because I didn't want to shame my father's name. I didn't want to drag my dad's name through the mud. I was like, I'm an Ingram, and, I, and wherever I go, that, that name follows me. In fact, I get this every so often. Come up and go, ah, oh, Ryan, you're a chip off the old block. I haven't heard that one before. <laughs> Listen. Wherever you go, as you leave this place, you bear the name of your heavenly Father. You carry it with you, and he has called you. Son, go in that. God's calling. He's 
calling you. He's calling me. How will you respond? As we enter into the presence of God, I want to give you some space and some silence just to be and to deal with God. Because some of you have not sat still for a very long time and you have not met with God. And you just simply need to look up and see God. Some of you have some junk in your soul that you need to deal with that has been building up and you need to leave it at the cross. And you need to walk out of here free. And you need to claim the promises of Scripture in your life. Some of you have been going back and forth. I'm all in, I'm not all in. I'm all in, I'm not all in. I don't know. And it gets really clear in moments like these, and then it gets really foggy right when you step out through the door. And you need to say tonight, God, here I am, send me. You need to write it down, you need to put it in your journal, and you need to go from this day forward, God, I'm going to trip up, I'm going to, whatever, it's going to be tough, but God, I send me. Quite of who you are, what you've done. Would you be kind enough just to send me? So I just ask you, just we're gonna dim the lights right now. Just close your eyes. And it's just gonna be silent. And for some of you, that might be a little hard. But between you and God. Enter his presence with reverence. Worship him. See God. Allow him to do the work in you. Declare that you are here.